Uh, I want to move on to some stories uh, pertaining to Amazon. Seems like we have things to cover with them virtually every week. Um, and I picked the Washington Post here for a reason, because I want to show you guys sort of the, the, the angle that they cover it from and how horrific it is. This is what owning a paper gets Jeff Bezos when it comes to stories about his company's misconduct. Um, so this again, the Washington Post NLRB accuses Amazon of threatening surveilling warehouse workers on Staten Island. So they are covering it, but I, I have a few points here that I'm going to point out how it's framed and, and uh, that kind of thing. This is by Aaron Gregg. Federal labor regulators on Thursday accused Amazon of illegally surveying and threatening workers who are trying to unionize a Staten Island, New York warehouse. The complaint first reported by Bloomberg News marks the National Labor Relations Board's latest brush with the e-commerce giant over questions about its, its tactics. The NLRB wants to compel Amazon to take certain actions to inform workers of their right to organize, according to Kathy Drew King, a regional director for the agency. Amazon repeatedly broke the law by threatening, surveying, and interrogating their Staten Island warehouse workers who are engaging in a union organizing campaign, King said in a statement. And I want you guys to notice here, we're in the third paragraph. They already have Amazon statement. Now, I'm sure a lot of you at home read a lot of news. I read a lot of news. That is usually at the bottom of the, uh, of the article. So the Washington Post, who's conveniently owned by Jeff Bezos, uh, uh, you know, putting that a little higher than usual. And I think that's worth pointing out. So they say Amazon spokeswoman Kelly Nantel said the uh, uh, allegations were false, adding without elaboration that we look forward to showing that through this process. <laughs> The complaint comes as a separate high stakes unionization effort is playing out in Alabama, where Amazon workers in Bessemer are poised to vote. And look at how they frame this. Workers there overwhelmingly rejected a union last year. So instead of starting with the NLRB ruled that Amazon broke the law and therefore they're forcing another election, they lead with the union was overwhelmingly rejected. You know, again, gee, I wonder why that might be. But the NLRB called for a revote after finding that Amazon improperly interfered in that election. Notice again, you guys, how that's worded. Not Amazon broke labor laws, which is what actually happened. They say improperly interfered. So they get the benefit of the, benefit of the doubt on all the phrasing and all the placement of things in the articles because it's owned by Jeff Bezos. And that's why I chose the Washington Post here. Um, an NLRB official sp uh, specifically cited Amazon's efforts to place an unmarked U.S. Postal Service mailbox in front of the warehouse just after voting started, writing that Amazon, quote, essentially hijacked the process and gave a strong impression that it controlled the process. It also coincided with a surge in labor activism across the country. Dozens of strikes and strike authorizations have flared up in recent months, including at Kellogg's and John Deere. The Amazon Labor Union, an independent group of workers that isn't connected to a major national union, recently collected the required signatures to hold a vote on Staten Island and NLRB. LRB spokesperson said Wednesday, a hearing on the vote is, is scheduled for February 16th. So obviously, as always, you guys, I encourage you to get involved uh, with striking workers and union uh, unionization attempts. If you're in that community, um, I would love to see this become more widespread. We're going to talk a little bit later about how that's happening right now with Starbucks and other companies. We've been covering virtually every week this, this labor movement across the country that has seen so many workers walk off the job, go on strike, protest, unionize, etc. Um, it's heartwarming to see. It's some it's a rare good news in the political sphere that we can bring you guys. Um, and uh, Amazon here just absolutely shameless, disgraceful in their conduct. They, they just have absolutely no shame and, and do not mind violating the law because they know they can get away with it. They know the system is propped up to give them the best possible outcome, even when they're found to have broken the law. Will there be any consequences for this, you guys, other than another election? Of course not. Do you think Amazon executives are going to face any sort of punitive action for literally violating labor law? No, of course not. Because the NLRB has no teeth and Congress won't do anything to actually arm them to go after these gigantic companies. Um, and I, I also wanted to talk a little bit about that Bessemer situation. We, we talked about how they had gone so far as to manipulate traffic lights so that drivers wouldn't stop next to picketing workers. Uh, that mailbox that was cited in the article was incredibly illegal. They even asked the NLR, NLRB specifically if they could do that. They were told no, they did it anyway. They had cameras on that mailbox. And then the, the, the management would tell workers, oh, we notice you haven't turned your ballot in yet, which meant they were watching those cameras. <laughs> And, and management would pressure you to bring your ballot in, right? Well, then you think you're on camera. You think that they're going to know your vote and you think you're going to be punished for that vote. By the way, one of the things Amazon accused of doing in Staten Island is specifically punishing people who were organizing. 
So they they they're just it, it, it's unscrupulous, you guys. It's 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 disgusting. It's they they have absolutely no shame. They know they don't have to follow the rules, and so they don't. And and yet workers are held to a completely different standard, right? Um, and and the Washington Post they're shaming that or uh, framing that story, excuse me, in a in a shameful way. Um, and there's also the story I didn't bring up an article about this, but I'm sure some of you saw it. Jeff Bezos has a new fucking super yacht that he had built. Um, and uh, apparently they are literally taking down a historical historical bridge in Rotterdam, a, a bridge that was bombed by the Nazis in World War II and was given historic status. They're taking that bridge down so that Bezos can get his fucking super yacht out of where it's built. I mean, you guys see how the world works for for the two classes of people. It's he's just he's like a fucking supervillain. I, I you know every little thing he does just so fits this caricature of him. This this evil, rapacious, greedy billionaire. Um, and you know it's just it's who would do that? You guys like even if I had the means to do that and wanted a nice super yacht, I would never dream of disrupting a historic landmark so that I could have a bigger yacht or that my yacht could be built specifically there. Have it built somewhere else, you fucking asshole. I mean, he's just it's it's unbelievable, you guys. The the um elitism, the sort of you know the the entitlement that they have about virtually everything that they do. Um. On a rather serious note, though, about Amazon, this is the other story I wanted to bring you guys. This is Matt Stoller breaking down. He, he's kind of an expert in antitrust and monopolization and stuff like that. And it, it turns out that the way that Amazon goes about bringing Prime to us is somewhat of a scam that essentially hits um, small businesses and the businesses that do business with Amazon, right, um, that sell through Amazon. So Stoller um, went on breaking points and gave a, a long explanation of this dynamic. I'm showing you guys a portion of that explanation. Um, and and, and, you know, it's just it's it's unsurprising as always with Amazon, but it's, it's very worthy of, of coverage and understanding. He, he he starts off, you guys, I can't remember if this is at the beginning of the clip or if it's right before the part that I clipped off. But he talked about how like some 70 percent of the country has a prime membership. OK, that's more people than put up a Christmas tree <laughs> in the United States. It, it is it is an incredibly American thing at this point to have an Amazon Prime membership. And, and that's a monopoly. That's that's a, effectively a monopoly. So, um you know, Stoller going into the details of how they sort of utilize that um, to screw small businesses, customers and employees and, and rake in the profits. Now, Amazon Prime, of course, is a membership affiliation program within Amazon, and it has a lot of members. There are roughly 140, 150 million Amazon Prime members in the United States. So the chances are fairly good that you already are one or live in a household with a member. To give some context, here's a chart that marketing professor Scott Galloway put together. As of 2019, there were more Amazon Prime households in America than there are households with someone who voted in the 2016 election, who go to church, who own a pet, or who decorate a Christmas tree. Why are there so many Prime members? Well, Prime offers a lot of benefits, including free shipping, grocery delivery, Prime video, music, games, photo backups, eBooks, discounts at Whole Foods, among other places. In, 20, in Amazon's 2015 shareholder letter, Jeff Bezos actually wrote, quote, we want Prime to be such a good value, you'd be irresponsible not to be a member. But mostly Prime is about free shipping. Free shipping is the god of online retail. So powerful that France actually banned the practice to protect its retail outlets. Free shipping is also the backbone of Prime. Bezos knew that the number one pain point for online buyers is shipping. One third of shoppers abandon their carts when they see shipping charges. Bezos helped invent Prime for precisely this reason, saying the point of Prime was to use free shipping to, quote, draw a moat around our best customers. The goal was to get people used to buying from Amazon knowing they wouldn't have to worry about shipping ch charges. They just see a, a number, and that's the price. Click. But this leaves a really big question. How does Amazon Prime make money? Now, sh sh shipping through Amazon Prime might be marketed as free to you, but it's not free. It takes trucks and planes and delivery people, all of whom have to get paid. Same with video games and content, all the other things you get for free with Prime. 
Now, from the fourth quarter of 2020 through the first nine months of 2021, just to take shipping, Amazon spent roughly $75 billion. It's a little less than $200 for every man, woman, and child in America. Now, Prime isn't free. There's a subscription fee of, a, of roughly $120 a year. But in 2018, JP Morgan found that the actual bundle of value of Prime should be $785. That is, when you go out into the market and you buy comparable products, that's what it costs. In other words, Amazon spends far more than the company gets back from Prime subscription fees. And that is weird. Somehow, Amazon seems to make money, or at least not lose money, on what appears to be a massively money-losing venture. If Amazon had to internalize the cost of Prime, it's not a small amount of money we're talking about. Amazon would be losing tens of billions of dollars just on Prime. And even a firm of that size can't lose that amount of money. So what gives? How can Amazon charge the lowest prices and throw in free shipping and in all the other great benefits for Prime members? To get an answer, I'd like to introduce you to the Attorney General of Washington, D.C., Carl Racine. Washington's like a little like a state, and it has, like most states do, a chief law enforcement officer. That's what Racine does. And here's what Racine thinks about Amazon. So Amazon is estimated to control 50 to 70 percent of the online retail market. That sounds like monopoly power. Racine enforces antitrust law, which is our main law against monopolistic behavior. In May of last year, he filed a complaint against Amazon, alleging that it was essentially hiding the real price of shipping and inflating the cost of what you buy, not just on Amazon or for Prime members, but everywhere you shop online, for virtually every product. Let's go back to Racine. Monopoly power. In this complaint, Racine alleges that Prime is a giant, albeit brilliant scam. Here's how it works. Amazon has two sides. To most of us, Amazon is a retailer. It is the storefront to the internet, selling more than 50% of products online, or roughly around that. But to millions of businesses who sell on Amazon, Amazon is a marketplace, a place not to buy, but to sell. Amazon connects sellers and suppliers who provide the products cons to consumers like you and me. It is a middleman. Behind its storefront, Amazon has multiple lines of business. It has a retail business where it sells directly. It's like Target or Walmart. But it, al it also has a fulfillment business called Fulfillment by Amazon, known as FBA. It's a little bit more like FedEx. It doesn't just sell directly, it also lets third-party sellers sell through another division marketplace. It's a little bit like eBay. And it charges them a set of fees to do so. It also has an advertising arm in which it lets firms pay for placement in its search engine and on, on its site and on sites around the web. At this point, just to give you some context, Amazon's advertising division is the third biggest online advertising firm in the world, behind Google and Facebook. Amazon has a lot of market power over these sellers, as well as brands who sell through Amazon's retail division. If you are selling online, you probably have to sell through Amazon, or you will miss a huge amount of the market. Let's go back to Racine. Guess what they have? Roughly 5% of the market. Amazon is the most visited website for online retail shopping with over 2.6 billion visits in a single month. 66% of consumers start their search for new products on Amazon. 74% go directly to Amazon when they're ready to buy a specific product. We brought this suit under the district's antitrust laws, which are designed to keep businesses operating honestly and fairly. And these laws protect competition. But it's worse than just missing sales. If you don't sell through Amazon, others might sell your products in your stead. They'll sell knockoffs or even counterfeits. Because Amazon has control of a large chunk of online retail customers, because it is the storefront to the internet, the way that Google is just the way you search for things, Amazon can dictate to terms to sellers who need to reach customers. And this is where free shipping comes in. As I noted before, shipping and logistics is extremely expensive, far more than the membership fees charged by Prime. Amazon spent $37.9 billion on shipping costs in 2019. This year, it'll be somewhere between 80 to $100 billion, something like that. No matter how amazing your logistics operation, you can't just offer free shipping to customers without having someone pay for it. Now, Amazon found its solution by extracting mon money from third-party sellers and brands, people on the other side of the platform, away from the consumer. 
Amazon forces third-party sellers to de facto pay for its shipping costs by charging them commissions that reach as high as 45% just to sell on Amazon. That's according to Racine. And that's merely to access Amazon customers, do fulfillment, things like that. So here's one Amazon seller explaining all the fees Amazon charges as one reason he's quitting the business. Then there is the Amazon FBA pick and pack fee. That's where I send my products into the Amazon warehouse, they store it for me, and then when I get an order, they pick it and they pack it and they ship it out. The next fee is there's a flat 15% fee just for selling on Amazon. That cost me about another $5,000 in Amazon fees. On top of these fees, there's just a bunch of random fees for selling on Amazon. Another expense a lot of people don't tell you about is their marketing expense. The best ways to market your product on Amazon is through Amazon's PPC, but that costs money as well. I spent about two or $3,000 on Amazon PPC. And of course, even with all these expenses, there's just random expenses that come up with running a business. For instance, one of my expenses is I have virtual assistants that handle a lot of the tedious work that I don't wanna do. And so I'll, I'll count that as about like $900. Now that's nearly half the revenue of a seller going just to Amazon. Now, how does Amazon force sellers to pay such high fees? Well, nearly anyone may list their wares on Amazon, but the ability for which Amazon takes a fee, but the ability to actually get your wares in front of customers is dependent on being able to, to quote unquote, win the buy box. The buy box is that white box on the right side that you get after you search for an item on Amazon. Let's throw the buy box up on the screen so you can see it. Now, over 80% of Amazon purchases go through the buy box. And Amazon awards the buy box to merchants based on a number of factors. A key factor is whether a product is Prime eligible, which is to say, offered to Prime members with free shipping. And in order to become Prime eligible, a seller basically has to use Amazon's warehousing and logistics service, Fulfillment by Amazon. Technically, you don't have to, but it's hard to win the buy box if you don't. In other words, Amazon ties the ability to access Prime customers to whether a seller pays Amazon for managing its inventory. Sellers know this. Here's Tatiana James, one of the many YouTubers who teach people to sell on Amazon. And then you also get a ranking boost. Amazon boosts people who are fulfilled by Amazon, so it's gonna help you in the search results. Amazon's strategy has worked. It now fulfills roughly two thirds of the products bought on its platform. The high prices of overall marketplace access fees, including fulfillment by Amazon, is how Amazon generates cash from its marketplace. From 2014 to 2020, the amount it charged third-party sellers grew from $11.75 billion to more than $80 billion. This year, it'll be about $120 billion. According to Racine, quote, seller fees now account for 21% of Amazon's total corporate revenue. And he also pointed out that the profit margins for marketplace sales by third-party sellers are four times higher than Amazon's own retail sales. So fantastic work there from Matt Stoller. Um, like I said, that that's really only about half of the segment that he did about that. He went into some more detail, but I wanted to try to get you guys kind of the meat of the story. Um, and what he was talking about at the end there is kind of the the key mechanism that they use the um, <clears throat> the 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 overwhelming likelihood that a sale is going to come through the the box um, to sort of apply the filters that allow them to then extract fees from sellers to um, place their products in a, in a place that actually might be sold. Another thing that Amazon did, we covered this a while back, um, they were busted essentially stealing products. I mean, they would they would recreate products that were selling well on Amazon, and then they would prioritize their own version, the stolen version of the product over the original that was made by some other business or some small business or what have you. Um, so there, it, again, you guys, it's just unscrupulous. Their behavior is, is purely rapacious. There is no other incentive. Amazon tries to frame themselves, as many of these companies do, as some sort of progressive or forward-thinking company. It's just all nonsense. I've covered many times before how starting at 15 an hour for warehouse work is not progressive. It's quite the opposite. It drags wages down. But Amazon gets to pretend, and the media allows Amazon to pretend as though they are some sort of progressive company. Uh, and that's just utter nonsense, you guys. Drivers pissing and shitting in bottles and bags is not an indication of a progressive company. The NLRB, which has been entirely defanged, coming out and actually saying you have to redo an election because you violated labor laws, that's not an indication that 
this company is behaving in progressive forward thinking and labor friendly ways. Um, so as always, you guys, I encourage everybody stand with workers in any situation that you can. If there is uh, labor organizing going on in your community, I encourage you not to cross the picket line and I encourage you to do what you can to support workers through mutual aid um, and, and that kind of a thing. So shame on Amazon for this conduct here. We'll keep an eye on those two unionization efforts on Staten Island and in Bessemer. And I hope that more pop up um, as this wave kind of continues.